So I'm going to start a new series. We've been doing a series on the things that, the questions that Jesus asked, but we did a few of them, and I'd, I'd like to go back and do more. He asked 307 questions, roughly, in the New Testament. So there's a lot of them we didn't cover, but I, I figured after five, six weeks of that, you, <laughs> you may be ready for me to move on. So I want to do a series on the church, the people of God. Today I want to start with the lessons called The Church, Its Purpose, and Why It Matters. Probably if you were to ask a lot of people out Side the building today, out there in the street corner, what do you think about church? You might get that it doesn't really matter anymore. It's kind of an obsolete organization, right? That it's lost its meaning to a lot of people. 59% of Christians that were done by some Pew researcher not too long ago didn't even believe that there was an absolute truth. That means that they didn't believe in the Word of God. 59% who professed to be Christians did not believe that the Bible any longer was... Well, they said they didn't believe in absolute truth. You can't know God without believing in an absolute truth. <laughs> the Bible is the Word of God. And it's the truth. And you have to have some grounds. I want... You know, I, um, four out of ten uh, babies that will be born today will be born to unwed mothers... In 24 hours, 1,000 unwed teens will, will become pregnant. 500 adolescents will turn to drugs. Six youth will commit suicide. I want you to think about that because the result of not believing that church is important is one of the reasons society is in the state that it's in. The reason that America is declining as it's declining in its morality is because it no longer believes in absolute truth. We've become a very individualistic, in, individualistic society in the village. <laughs> Say that for me, Linda. I can't get it out right now. <laughs> Individual. But it's all about us. It's all about me. It's what I like, what I want, when I want it, how I want it. So I can stay home and watch TV and get everything I need about church, right? The reason I say this to you is I want, I want to go for, the, for this lesson only today. I want you to see the church as Jesus saw the church. He used the word church two times in the Gospels. Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 18. We're going to look at those. I want you to see the church as Jesus saw the church. Because I believe if you see the church as Jesus saw the church, you'll see that it is the greatest institution that he ever thought was going to exist in this world. That when he established his church, he did it to make a difference in this world. He did it to put a body of believers who was going to come to him and worship and serve a lost and dying world. Jesus saw it as every bit as crucial as anything else that was ever going to take place. So when you and me downplay the church and we tell ourselves, well, I just don't really need to go. You're doing yourself a dissatisfaction and you're not looking at the church. I assure you the way Jesus saw the church. He never saw it as an option. He never saw it as something you might do or you might like to do or not like to do. Jesus saw it as his body, the bride, and he believed it was critical. And he believed that you participate in it. I've got it later in a slide, but I might as well say it now. You don't join a church to join Jesus. You join Jesus and he places you in a church. If you don't join yourself to Jesus through your death, burial, and resurrection, by your belief in Him, your confession of your sins, your repentance, you being buried, so that you can get into Christ, you're not in His body. But Jesus said, if you want to join me and you believe in me, then I'll place you in the church. Because I'm going to build my church. And so I want you to think about some of that, because we have watered down what church is to be. We make it an entertainment Facility. We come to be. We come to be entertained. We come to to get. We come to take. I've said this to you before. Because again, I want you to think about it in, in context with this lesson. What did you do to come here this morning to prepare yourself to, to get ready to worship? How much time did you spend on your knees before you got here this morning, saying to yourself, "God, I'm just so thankful that I can come into the house of God." I'm so thankful that I'm coming to worship you. There's no greater part of my week than this Sunday morning. I've been waiting seven days for this, Father. I'm so glad that I could get up this morning and go down and worship with members of the same body bought by the blood of your son. I'm so glad that I could come here and sing songs of praise and be encouraged and lifted up. 
Or did you think about going deer hunting because it's opening weekend with muzzle loader? <laughs> I did, but I thought I was a preacher. I better show up. <laughs> but no, it, it, we let a lot of things get in the way. And I just want you to think about that as we move through, down through some of these things because there's so many that have just played church down as if it's not important. We know what COVID did. Locked us up. Tried to keep some away. And, and uh, some haven't even recovered today. But I want you to think about what is the church. You ever thought about that passage in the Bible where it says, Where two or three are gathered together, there I shall be too. Is that a church? If you're meeting at a coffee shop every day and you're talking with two or three people and, and, and you're discussing scriptures, is that a church? I don't think it is according to what Jesus was talking about. But I think sometimes we water down the word Christian and church and think that, it's, that, that they're the same. They are not the same. Just because three Christians are meeting somewhere and they're discussing scriptures does not make them a church. And just because you're sitting in your recliner chair and you're thinking that that's all you need, that does not make you a church. When you're in your reclining chair, that's CPR. <laughs> you're on, you're on, you need emergency take. You need emergency help, so you're getting CPR. You're on life support. That's not where you're supposed to remain. There's times that you might be home in your recliner because of CPR. But you're supposed to be assembling with your brothers and sisters. And you're supposed to be meeting as the body of Christ. And you're supposed to be encouraging and uplifting one another. So I hope you don't think that staying at home in your living room or out on the lake is the same thing as coming and worshiping God. I hope, I hope when the lesson is done, I will say this to you. That you see the church as Jesus sees the church. So this is the verse that Ricky read to us. It says, when Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? And they replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Um, but what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Who do you say God is? He says, uh, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And then the next verse we know goes on to tell him that, well, Simon, you're blessed. This was not revealed to you by man, but by God. That means that this is truth. No matter what the world says, no matter what your friends say, no matter what you hear on the news, no matter what you read in a newspaper, this is truth. Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And on that confession, he says, I'll, make, I'll build my church in the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus said, I'm building my church, and I'm building my church basically on myself, the rock, as you go on. Read. I'll give the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you build on earth, he says, will be down in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah because the time wasn't right. But Jesus is building his church. Not your church, not my church, not a church that fits the world. He's building his church on the rock. He is the rock. The solid foundation. Any church that's not built on the rock is not a church. At least it's not a church in Jesus' eyes. It may be a false church. If you don't have a church home, I would, I would tell you, find a church. Find one that preaches the truth. Find one that stands for the truth. Find one that gives the truth in their classes. Find one that sings the truth. Find one that lives out the truth. Don't go unchurched. You cannot be a member of the body of Christ without being in a church. You cannot do it. Now, you might not like that teaching, but it's, we're going to get through some of this as we do it. Jesus is referring to his church in this sense, at this time, in this verse, as universal. Now, he'll change it in, in chapter 18. He's going, to, he's going to talk about the local church. But the two times he talks about it, the very first time here, it's universal. He said, I'm going to build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against my church. I know he's talking universal because the gates of hell have prevailed against some churches. You can go to Revelation chapter 2 when he's talking to a, a, a Ephesus. He says, I've got this against you. You have left your first love and if you don't repent, I will come and take my candlestick away from you. There are churches that have come and gone and fallen. Jesus is not talking about that church. He's talking about a universal church where you're placed up, but you become a member of them when you become a believer in Jesus Christ. 
That church, the gates of hell will not prevail against no matter what the world says out there, no matter what society says, no matter what's printed or on the news. Jesus' church is never going to die out. Nothing is going to beat his church. It's the greatest institution that was ever established. It's done more good in this world than anything else. And nothing will prevail against his church. No believer that dies that believes in Jesus Christ will go to hell. Hell will not prevail against Jesus Christ. He's going to build his ch church on the solid rock of which he is the head. Of which he is the boss. This isn't Burger King. <laughs> you don't get it your way. Hold the lettuce, hold the tomato, special orders, don't upset us. I know it's before your time. <laughs> this is his, his church. This is a universal sense. He's speaking of all believers in every place at every time. From the ages of ago when he established the kingdom to today. There will always be his church. And it will not die out. He said in Matthew 16, 18, And I tell you what you are, Peter, what you said, Peter, this rock, I'll build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Jesus tells us there is one church. The church is his church. I want you to get that. There's many verses in the Bible that we could go actually look at, but uh, if you looked in Ephesians, you looked in 1 Corinthians, I'm going to bring up some of those scriptures in a minute anyway, so I won't, I won't, I won't go into them now, but I just want you to get the idea that it's his church. No matter what you think about church, it's not all about you. That's become a big problem for us. I'm not just talking Glenwood, but a lot of people, first time you get offended, if you think it's your church, what do you do? You quit and go home. You leave. You go shopping for another church. You're not happy. I just want you to know that it's his church. You've been placed in his body. And when you come, it's full of people. And so, yes, there'll be, there'll be people you don't see eye to eye with. It wasn't supposed to be that way. You have commonality in Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean we're all going to lose our personalities. We're all going to look as good as me. <laughs> but, but there's truth in that. There's truth in the sense that you're, you're a member of the body of Christ. When you got placed in that church, you got to know the priority of it. Because the world, again, out there in the street corners, just, oh, you don't need to go. There's nothing down there for you. Their singing isn't, isn't hip-hop. It isn't whatever. And you're going to hear excuse after excuse after excuse. And you have to know that Jesus never saw his church that way. He saw it as a body of believers that would show up and worship him and do service that's what Jesus thought of the church. And I'll show you some of the verses. So how did Jesus view the church? Ephesians 4, 5. There's one body, one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. You might say up there when he says the body, he says there's one church, one faith, one hope, one baptism, one Lord and God over all. There's not, just because you see all these other churches around you, that is not what Jesus is talking about. When, you know, he's not talking Baptist, Presbyterian, Methodist, Church of Christ. It's his church, yes. But sometimes when you see a name on a board out there, you think that that's, well, that's the local. That's not what he's talking about. He says, I'm going to build my church of believers who believe in me. Put their faith in me. Trust in me. Submit to me. Surrender to me. Do all those things that you're supposed to do. He said, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become together and respect the mature body of him who is the head. This is, he's the head of the church. Not you, not me, not an elder, not a preacher. Is Christ. If one part suffers, this is the part I want you to get from 1 Corinthians 12. He's, you know, if you know your Bible, you go to 1 Corinthians 12. He's going to say that the body of the church is made up of many parts. And one part can't say that it's better than another part. The toe can't say I'm better than the ear. He gets down here and he says if, if that part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part is rejected. Uh, if one, I'm sorry, is honored, uh, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is part of it. I want you just to know that you're part of the body. And you can't remove yourself without hurting the body. You are critical, you are needed, and that's how Jesus viewed his church. So don't sell yourself short. Don't buy the lies that I'm not needed down there because you are. 
Wherever you find yourself, wherever your church home is, you're needed in that body of Christ. How does Jesus view the church again? In 2 Corinthians 11, 2 and 3, he says, I'm jealous with you with a godly jealousy. I like this. Jesus sees you as special when you're in his church. He has a godly jealousy for you. He says, I promised you to the husband, to Christ. We know he's the bridegroom. You're the bride, the church. We're going to look at other verses like that in the Bible. If you, if you had a bride, if you're just getting ready to get married, how do you look at your bride? She's the most precious thing that you, you were just so excited that day. The expression when I do weddings that you see people's face when they turn around and they look at their bride coming down the aisle. You can tell they're just, sometimes they break out in tears. They didn't, couldn't even believe that the one that they had been dating is that beautiful and she's coming down the aisle. Jesus looks at the church as if it's his bride. So again, let me ask you, if you don't see the church that way, if you don't see the church as something special, if you don't see the church as something that is, I mean, above normal. Jesus doesn't see the church as just every day, just some place to go down and spend some time. He sees it as his bride, as his body, which he's the head of. You're selling it short. Anything short of seeing it as the bride is falling short of how Jesus sees the church. He sees it as his pure bride. And when you say, oh, that's just not that important, you're selling yourself short. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon. Well, we talked about, I wanted you to know this is the truth. We've talked about the church stands solid on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Again, talk to you about him being the rock. I like Acts 2, 4, it says, so praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily those which are being saved. Now, the reason I say that to you is, again, when you think about the universal church, you don't control who comes in and out of God's church. They're added by God. You can go to other scriptures in the Bible. It says, I have others that you do not even know of. What I want you to get is the idea that Jesus is the one who adds people to the church, not you, not me. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. You follow the, the steps to become saved and you are added to his church. You don't, I don't vote on that. You don't vote on that. We don't decide whether their past is good enough. We don't decide whether their sins are bad enough. or been That's done by Jesus Christ. And he adds to the church those that ought to be saved. We're not in that business. I want you to know that. Matthew 13, 24 to 30 says the parable of the week. This is interesting now. <laughs> You, you study this and look around the room. Some of you might be weak. Some of you might be shaft or tares. They grow together. You ever grow a garden? We talked about this in class. When I grow a garden, I get weeds. <laughs> I don't plant weeds. I get weeds. They just keep coming. And I keep pulling them and they keep coming. Gets to a point where I can't pull the weeds because they're overtaking so bad. I have to take the good out to get rid of the bad. Jesus says, leave me alone at the day when judgment comes, I'll separate them. That means today, somewhere in every church meeting that's God's church, there are wheats and tares meeting. Some are meeting because they love Jesus Christ, they want to serve Jesus Christ, they give his life to Jesus Christ, and others are coming because it's a game. Or they're getting a check mark. I don't know what the reason is, but they're not sold out. They're not committed. Maybe they came because mom and dad forced them. Maybe they came because a friend asked them. Maybe they came because they just, it was Christmas time and I had to get it checked off. It's Easter. If you're a member in the body of Jesus Christ, then that's not you. <laughs> because you, 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 you're either real or you're fake. And the master knows whether you're playing a game. And the day of judgment will come and he will separate the tares from the wheat. But that's how he views his church. The local church. This is where he talks about the local churches. I didn't put it up there. It's Matthew 18, 15. If your brother or sister sins, you probably all know this one. If your brother and sister sins against you, you're to go to them. Which would be a lesson, a whole other lesson we can learn on ourselves. We're not to gossip it. Gossip we're not to tell everybody else. We're not to write it in a newspaper. We're not to post it on Facebook. We're not to share it out on Twitter. Or send emails. All of which I know have been done. <laughs> All of which I'm probably guilty of. But you're to go to them. And help them. And ask them. And tell them. And hope they repent. 
But if they don't repent, then he says here, then if they refuse the lesson 17, tell it to the church. In this sense, church is the local church. You don't tell it to the, every church, right? That'd be impossible. You're not going to write a letter to the universal church and say, hey, I want every one of you to know. No, you're doing it down there at the local body where he's at. So Jesus used it in two senses. He knew of the sense of the universal church. He also spoke of the local church, like the church of Ephesus or the church of Colossae. And so we are a local church, the Glenwood Church of Christ. He says, tell it to the church. They refuse to listen even to the church. Treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. And so I just want you to get, these are the two times that you, I want you to get the definition of church that Jesus had. Universal and local. Because you're a member of a local church. This word church is ecclesia. It's the two, two words, ecclesia. It means called out. You are a called out people. You're to be different, is what Peter would say. You'd be holy, a holy nation, separated unto God. You're called out. Deuteronomy 4.10 says, Remember the day I, that I stood before the Lord your God at Horeb when he said to me, Assemble. That's another same word of Ecclesia, only it's in Hebrew. But it, the definition is the same. I want you to see it because what God said, Jesus did a very interesting thing in Matthew. He went all the way back to the Hebrew tents, took their word, he turns it into Ecclesia, and he says, You are the assembled. You are the church. You are the called out. And when I called you out of Deuteronomy, I called you out, he said, to the people before me to hear my words so that they may learn to revere me as long as they live in the land and may teach them to do their uh, teach them to their children. What he's saying is, I called you out to come and learn about me. That's what we do as a church. You are called out to assemble this morning to come. You assemble in order that you can learn about God. You can learn what he wants for you in your life. You can learn what it is to serve him. You can learn what it is to be forgiven. All the things. But that's one of the things the church does. It assembles so it can hear the word of God. If you assemble to be entertained or you assemble, and I'm not, I'm not against entertainment when I say that. I mean, I think we should have fun. But what I'm, what I'm trying to say is if all you're doing is to come here and to be entertained, but you don't care anything about God, you're missing the point. Jesus said when he used that tense, uh, sense, he's saying, I called you out to assemble just like they did in Deuteronomy so you can hear the word of God. So you can be blessed. So you can learn to revere me. Respect me. Now that's something America needs. That's something we haven't done well. And many pulpits have changed. I hear a lot of people say, if, 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 it's, if, if there's a pole bear in the pulpit, there'll be a polar bear in the fuse. If somebody in fire in the pulpit, there'll be somebody in fire in the fuse. I hear a lot of people don't blame the way the world is all on the preacher, the preacher, the preacher. It's not the pulpits are bad. I'm going to tell you something right now. Preachers are responsible, but you as a member of the church are responsible. You, as a member of the body of Christ, all play a part in the way the church goes. You all play a part in whether it makes any difference down here in Glenwood or at your school or at your job or anywhere you live. You've been called out, separated, leave the old life, live a new life, get out of darkness, get into light. That's done in the church through Jesus Christ. And you are a part of that. If you think the world's gone the wrong way and the church has failed, you and me are a part of that reason. Not just a preacher. Yes, pulpits ought to preach the truth. They ought to stand for the truth. Yes, we've had bad preachers. We've also had bad members. <laughs> it's the truth. Isaiah 49, 6. This is the other reason I think he calls us. He said, it's too small of a thing for you to be my servant, to restore the tribes of Jacob and bring back those of Israel I have kept. I will also make you a light for the Gentiles that my salvation may reach to the ends of the world. This is our job. He has called you out to come, to assemble, to learn about him, and to go and tell that message. That's what we exist for as a church. We come, we learn, we go, we serve. That is what we're to do as a church. First Peter 2.9, this is when I told you, but you are a chosen people, the royal priesthood, a holy nation. I won't spend a lot of time. I just want you to know, if you're a child of God, you're called out. You're different. This is how Jesus views the church. This isn't, this isn't how I view the church. This isn't, my, this isn't my take on it. I mean, I believe it. But I'm just trying to tell you that this, this is through the eyes of Jesus is what he sees as the church. He sees a group of called out people who are changed, who are different. Like Logan said, they're not that old person. That part is left. They're a new person. And they're to make a difference. I'm asking today, this is my conclusion to you. 
Do you, do you like many believers who have gone before from every age and every place profess that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? Is that you? Looking around the room, I think it's most people. I've seen some head nodding, nodding yep. Yeah. Are you ready to repent of your sins if you're not? He said, do you want to become, I said, do you want to become a part of Jesus? And I told you this earlier, you don't join the church to become a part of Jesus. You join Jesus and are added to the church. Those other verses there are all about what he sees in the church, the head of the church, the pride, all of that. I want you to know that the church, as we start this series, all I wanted to get across today is that Jesus saw two, two churches, the universal church, the local church. You're all a member of the local church, this church. You're part of the body. That body has a head. That head is Jesus Christ. As a member of the body, every part is important. No one's more important than the other. But to separate yourself and to tell you that you're not needed or that you can get this from home in the living room or out on the lake is not the truth. It is not the same thing as assembling on worship on Sunday morning. And worshiping God. I'm not saying there's never a time to miss. But I'm telling you that if that becomes your attitude of your. It's just not. That's, that's the way to go. Then you're not viewing the church as the way Jesus views the church. You're a part of the greatest institution that ever lived. That has changed more lives. Made more difference. Helps more people. Than any other institution that ever existed. And we ought to show up on Sunday morning. And learn about God. And lead to do service. And praise him because of what he's done for us. What he did, he said, I'm going to build my church on this rock and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Nobody can take away the church from us. They may mandate that we can't meet. They may bar the doors. They may be all kinds of things. The church will never die. Because it's built on Jesus Christ. I told him in class, Luke chapter 6, verses 47, 48 says, The wise man built his house on the solid rock. The foolish man builds his house on the sand. What have you built your house on? What have you built your house on? It's a serious question. Logan's going to come lead us in a song. And if you're here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ, or somewhere along the line you went sidetracked, somehow you got off the solid foundation and you bought into the lies, I hope you'll come back. Come on, Logan. <laughs>